on. Tell me when, Mom. No. All right, we're on. <laughs> I like to record them, so if you if you want to share the lecture with someone, you can give them a YouTube link and watch it later or send it to someone else. So how many of you have been to one of my lectures before? Uh, everyone except maybe Derek. <laughs> and you're new. What's your name? Lisa. Lisa, thank you for coming, Lisa. How did you find out about uh, the lecture? Hey, you told me Fantastic, <laughs> thank you. All right, well, I'll do a little brief introduction then. My name is Dr. Deborah Langhelm, and I am a naturopathic doctor. That's what ND stands for. I also have my master's in public health, and I am a certified health education specialist. And I'm doing right now what I, my passion is, which is public speaking. This is what I really love doing. I like seeing patients one-on-one, -on -one too, or clients one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but I also, I'd say 50-50, the 50% of my time I like to do, make a bigger impact with larger audiences. So that's what I'm practicing doing right now, so you guys are helping me practice get better at my public speaking. Okay, so I always include about six slides that te explain what naturopathic medicine is. That's for you to look at later. If you put your name on the list over there, I will email you the uh, PowerPoint, you know, this PowerPoint slide, and you can look into it if you're curious what naturopathic medicine is. But we don't have enough time for me to go into depth on them, so I'm going to go through them quickly. This describes our scope of practice. In the state of, um, so there are 26 states and jurisdictions that allow um, naturopathic medicines to be legal primary care physicians. Uh, Tennessee is not one of them. So I am a licensed primary care physician, but not in the state. So this right here is for educational purposes only. If any of this interests you, please review it with your primary care physician to make sure it's appropriate for you. That's my little disclaimer. Here's Tennessee, we're not. Advocacy initiatives are in process, but we haven't got um, licensed yet. Okay, so that's the disclaimer that I just said. And this is the therapeutic order, so I'll briefly spend a minute on this. Uh, as naturopathic doctors, we approach health and healing from a different perspective than allopathic medicine, which is medical doctors. We like to start at the bottom of what we call the therapeutic order, and we remove the obstacles to cure, and then we go up. So, and we use higher and higher force options as we go up. So, pharmaceuticals and surgery would be at the very top of, of the therapeutic order, and it would be the last thing that we use to try to solve a problem, suppress the pathology. We start down here, making sure that you have all the cofactors that you need for healing. But even if you eat all the right food and you're sleeping good and you're drinking water and you're doing everything right, if you are constantly exposed to some kind of environmental toxin, that could be an obstacle that's preventing you from healing. So we also, at the very bottom of the therapeutic order, we make sure we remove any obstacles to cure. And um, that means make sure you don't have any heavy metals in your environment or mold in your house or things like that. So that's how we approach medicine and that should give you a feel for how I approach everything. I'll start at the very bottom. Okay, so. Today's talk is on giving fresh air. This is the second um, time I've given this lecture. I've updated it a bit, so that was oh, it's always fun. Every time I give the same lecture, I update it a bit. Air and our air quality, specifically indoor air quality, is something that I am passionate about. It's something that I believe we don't, we being all of us, uh, doctors, everyone, we don't really put enough attention into it, and, and I think my passion really uh, became accentuated with when COVID-19 happened because I realized our indoor air is a huge contributing factor to whether or not we have transmissibility of infectious pathogens in our air, airborne infectious pathogens. And so if you were at my lecture last time, I taught you all about indoor air quality and how to significantly reduce the transmissibility of infectious pathogens very easily. And so I hope you got to see it. If you didn't, please go on my YouTube channel and watch it because it's a spectacular lecture that will contribute to your lung health uh, and just really make you a lot more healthy. But today is sort of like a, an add-on to that lecture, but more of in a fun way, and that's how do plants in our indoor environment contribute to our air quality and our well-being in general? And so we're gonna talk about that. And that's what today's lecture is, a little bit more fun. I brought one plant. I could have brought a whole table full of them, but that's too much trouble, so I didn't bring all of them. Okay, so some, some basic information. We take 23,000 breaths each day, and the surface area of our lungs is approximately the size of a tennis court. Okay, here we go, tennis court right here. That's a lot of surface area of our lungs. And the reason we have that huge surface area is so that way we can do this oxygen carbon dioxide exchange. 
And so that's what that little picture is showing. And over our lifespan, if you estimate that we're 79 years old, um, we take about 60, 672 million breaths. So, you know, I want to think about this a little bit. You know, if you imagine a fish in a fishbowl with really dirty water, it's disgusting. You're think you would want to clean the fishbowl. We all live in a fishbowl in our work buildings and in our homes. And so if we can do something to uh, clean that air and keep that, you know, a lot of the toxins in our air are invisible. So unlike a fishbowl where you can see the water is foggy, we don't see if there's toxins in our air. It's usually invisible. Sometimes we can smell it like a volatile organic compound, uh, but that's about it. So we're largely unaware. If a room feels stuffy, like you walk in, you're like, this feels icky and stuffy, that usually means there's high carbon dioxide. So there's some stuff I'm going to teach you about how plants can really make a difference. Okay, so this is a slide I showed last time. It's worth repeating. We spend a large portion, basically about 93% of our time in some kind of indoor environment if you include a vehicle. So uh, that's a lot. That's over 90% of our lives we are indoors. So it's worth thinking about that air that we breathe. Okay, so this is where that data came from. It was from the National Human Activity Pattern Survey, and that's where they, they got those numbers. <clears throat> All right, so sick building syndrome. How many of you have heard of sick building syndrome? Yeah, some people have. It's something that's been studied now for a while, for a few decades, because we started noticing that when we were making these ecological buildings and that are real tight to make them energy efficient, um, that we were causing people to get sick. And it's because there was no air exchange from outside because we were making them so tight. So by solving one problem, you know, making them more ecological from an energy efficiency standpoint, we are making them less healthy. And so sick building syndrome is something that we uh, have been as all over the world, India and everywhere, we've been trying to think of how do we make our buildings more healthy while at the same time efficient. And one way is putting plants inside the buildings along with all the other things I talked about last, last time. But anyway, these are some of the aspects of air quality we went over last time, uh, but it's not just about uh, plants, obviously. It's about getting fresh air exchange, you know, the tight indoor space, new versus old buildings. You know, there's so many things, and we went over most of this last time. Specifically, relative humidity is a huge, huge component of uh, the transmissibility of infectious pathogens. And plants can help raise the humidity of your indoor environment naturally, which is really fantastic. Okay, so we had this slide last time as well. This is the distribution of gases in our air. So the air we're breathing right now is mostly nitrogen, and it only has a little bit of carbon dioxide. Uh, what do these two things show right now? Is it say 400 and something? 400, yep, okay. So the carbon dioxide parts per million in this room right here is very good. So Anywhere between 400 and 450 is considered outside air. So that would be fantastic. That would be the ideal carbon dioxide concentration that you're looking to have in an indoor environment. You can even go up to 600 and I wouldn't be upset. I'd be like, that's great. You don't, you know, that's a great distribution. Uh, but you'll find that um, our bedrooms are some of the worst because uh, we have usually we can have two adults in the same room, perhaps, sleeping, maybe an animal or two in the room sleeping, and that will dramatically increase your carbon dioxide level in the bedroom. So if you look here, poor bedroom ventilation can get you up to 4,000. So I did an experiment in my own bedroom, and I closed the door, and I turned off the ventilation for one night just to see what would happen, and then I slept like normal, and I was the only person in my bedroom, and it's a huge bedroom, so it's really big a lot of air and I went from 400 when I went to bed to when I woke up I was 900 950 and that was just me in the bedroom no it wasn't two adults and two dogs or something like that so it definitely um, having proper ventilation and air exchange in your bedroom at night is important even if you just crack your window uh, it's not going to kill you to have 900 you know 900 is still they're saying is the upper comfort boundary and I didn't even notice it, so you know, it didn't feel stuffy to me. Maybe a little stuffy, you know, in the room, but not too bad. And the um, uh, so, I usually can detect it when it's over 600. I can walk in a room and it just it has this thick, stuffy feeling for me. So when you feel that stuffy feeling, 
you know, um, you probably need to crack a window, you know, if you're somewhere where you can do that. And sometimes in hospitals and clinic rooms, you can't open the windows, and so that's really crummy. It just, you know, trying to, if you have access to the ventilation in those bedroom, those rooms, I recommend you open them. So opening the window is like the best thing. So in your bedroom, if you don't have good ventilation, just cracking your window a little bit is enough. That's enough to get enough air exchange to make the carbon dioxide level in your room um, really adequate. Uh, so what happens if you have bad carbon dioxide levels or high carbon dioxide levels in your, in your home environment or your work environment chronically? And the answer is, over time, it can affect your cognition. Because what happens is just like sleep apnea, um, you know, you have to wear a CPAP, you know, to help you get oxygen at night. Well, with, if you have too much carbon dioxide in your environment, it causes a systemic inflammation in your body to go up. And that systemic inflammation can lead to hardening of the arteries and, it can, and, and narrowing of the arteries and can lead to you know, heart issues and all kinds of things and cognitive decline. So you really want to pay attention to the carbon dioxide in your room. So for my recommendation is buy a, a carbon dioxide sensor. They're not that expensive and keep it in your bedroom and just make sure, just do a little check and make sure you, you have good um, carbon dioxide levels in your bedroom. Okay, so. This is yet another chart. It's an interesting one. They go up to 1,000 here again, but I would say you should be shooting for 600 is really where you want to you want to go. Um, I know when I was working as an engineer, we would have these big meetings all day long with all these people in what we called a skiff, and I know if I had a carbon dioxide test, we were way over here. Like you could barely breathe in there. We had so many people crammed in with lack of ventilation. So even at work, try to make a point of making sure there's good um, ventilation. Okay, so this is another chart right here, just for your reference. And that is pretty accurate to me. When it's about 700, I feel the air is stuffy. You know, it's, you know I, can, I can feel it. Anything 600 and lower feels good and uh, is good. Okay, so what are the medical studies that prove that, this, that our cognition decreases when you get up to 900 or 1,000 or higher? Well, this, this study is fantastic. It, it, clearly demonstrated that even modest increases in carbon dioxide significantly decreased your cognitive functioning in nine different categories, right? So here are the nine categories. It's focused activity. I'm gonna show you another slide, so don't worry, it'll be bigger. But basically what you're seeing is, here's 500 or 600. That's right where I said I, I think you should be shooting for. But as you go higher, even just a little bit, you're going all these forms of cognition just, just go down like crazy. Only these two sort of are not affected a whole lot, and that was focused activity and information search. So that's like searching for on Google or something, I guess, um, which I found fascinating that they stayed the same. But here's, a, here's another uh, slide, or another way of showing the same data. So this is the exact same data, showed a different way. Here are the nine cognition areas that they measured. And what you're seeing here is that 600 parts per million which I said I believe is the upper limit of what you want. You're doing pretty good. You're pretty high. You're in the very good to average to you know range. Uh, 400 is fantastic. So we should all be way up here, you know. <laughs> and um, but once you get to like a thousand, which is pretty normal for a bedroom with two people breathing in it, right? Uh, at night, you're going to start seeing you're going down to the lower than average, so especially in information utilization, which is the whole reason you want information, right? So that way you can utilize it. If you're doing something that requires some brain power, you want to get the information and use it. And so, uh, as an engineer, you know that would be really important. And remember, I told you we were at all be in a room, and I know we were probably 4,000 parts per million. It was you couldn't even breathe in these rooms, and so we weren't doing a, we weren't doing ourselves any favors, right? Because we were in the dysfunctional range for uh, information and initiative, and you know the breadth of approach. Because we were usually trying to solve problems, you know, what, you know, come up with ideas for things. Well, you can't do that when your brain's not working because there's too much carbon dioxide in the room. So um, we should put some plants in there. So we're going to get the plants here. Um, some other information, here we go. Typical CO2 concentration in the bedroom without ventilation, they're saying it's above 2,000. That, these are all uh, relative, depending on how many people are in the room, how big the room is, and all that kind of thing. Like uh, mine, I got up to 900, 950. So, uh, but if you have two people, it would have doubled probably. 
Um, but the car is real bad too, so make sure you have good ventilation in your car as well because it'll help you drive better. Your brain will work better. And Okay, so why do we care about oxygen in the bedroom? I, I mentioned it a little bit, but about how it, chronic low oxygen in the bedroom, which means high carbon dioxide, will uh, cause a systemic inflammation in your body that leads to many different things. Well, this study right here talks about well, what, what is our oxygen saturation at different phases of our sleep. So when you're awake, they're saying for people that are older, it's about 97.3. That's actually fantastic. I don't like um, a blood oxygen saturation above 98 or 99 uh, for anyone uh, because uh, it makes the hemoglobin bind to the oxygen too tightly and you can't release it into your brain easy. So I think this totally makes sense to me, the study that when you're in slow wave or delta sleep, which I'm gonna talk a little bit more about, it's 95, 96.5, and REM sleep, it's 96.2. That makes sense, because if you're breathing slower and your heart rate slower, you want the hemoglobin to be able to release the oxygen easier into your brain, and it would do that when it's around 96, so that's fantastic. So, but basically, you want oxygen while you're sleeping. This study talks about how oxygen promotes deep restorative sleep, and so what they're saying is, that um, having enough oxygen in your bedroom helps you stay in slow wave sleep. And slow wave sleep is like a pressure washer for your brain. So this picture is showing these people scrubbing your brain with a, a high note, a, high, a little nozzle, because basically deep restorative sleep is considered delta wave sleep, it's slow wave sleep, and that's what prevents you from having a cognitive decline because it clears out the amyloid plaques from your brain and if you're not getting enough slow delta wave sleep at night then you are building up these amyloid plaques over time and um, that could lead to cognitive decline so of all different kinds so this is a normal sleep cycle right here okay so at the beginning of the night when you first go to bed you go into your first cycle of sleep and you go through many stages of sleep, stage one, two, and three. And this right here is the delta wave or slow wave sleep. And if you notice that first cycle of sleep, you get the longest and the most deep sleep. Your second cycle, you get a little bit less and then you don't get it at all, right? So as the night goes on, you don't get it. So, so basically a normal healthy sleep, sleeping cycle through a night you will get almost all of your delta slow wave sleep in the first three to four hours of your sleep. So you don't want to be woke, woken up during that time. So let's say you go to bed at 10.30, but your husband or your wife likes to go to bed at 1 a.m. and they come in and wake you up every night at 1 a.m. when they come to bed later. That is not good for your health. They are, they are not helping your brain out any. Because if they wake you up during this deep sleep cycle, you're gonna miss it, you're not gonna get it. And it has to do with light hitting our eyes, our circadian rhythms. So you can't go to bed at 1 a.m. right here and wake up at 9 or 10 a.m. right here and say, oh, well, I got my eight hours. I just went to bed at 1 a.m. No, if you go to bed at 1 a.m., you miss all your deep sleep. Because it has to do with light and your circadian rhythms. So you have to go to bed early enough as well. So make sure you go to bed by 10, 10.30 at the latest, because that's when you're gonna get to sleep. So I'm gonna show you some things here. Okay, so we spend about that much time tossing and turning. Then we spend about 50, 45, 50% in light sleep, what's called light sleep. All, if you add up all the deep sleep of the whole night, it's about 13 to 23%. And then REM sleep is about 20, 25%. But this is the sleep, this is called slow wave sleep or delta wave sleep or deep sleep, it's all synonymous, and that's what's gonna prevent cognitive decline. Okay, so we keep going. Um, for me, I, uh, I keep track of it using an aura ring. So this is my aura ring right here. And so every night I track my sleep because I have huge sleep issues. <laughs> and um, so I wanted to figure out what the heck was going on and how do I change my trends. And so these were just screen captures from online and so of what people's sleep cycles might look like. But let me show you what mine looks like. Okay, here's me <laughs> on an average night. And I think this is really interesting, right? Because what you're seeing is all my deep sleep happens at the beginning part of the night, like you're supposed to, right? And then I don't have any in the light. Now this is an extreme example. Sometimes I'll have a little snippet of deep sleep over here, right? But 
almost all the time. If I go to bed at 10.30 and I wake up around here, like all my deep sleep's gonna happen early in the night. And if I go to bed later than 10.30, I, I just, it won't happen. Like I won't have, I'll, I'll, I'll get deep sleep, but only before, and in, the, in this case, it looks like I hit about 2.20 a.m. I usually don't even go that far. Like, you know, like it's all usually before 1 a.m. for me. But everyone's a little different, and so you might find that your body allows you to have more later in the night, but it's something to be aware of. It's worth as we get older, um, and I have a whole lecture on YouTube that's like an hour and a half on nothing but sleep and the details of what I'm talking about now. How does this have to do with plants? Well, if you remember a couple slides ago, oxygen in the bedroom, enough oxygen, is what helps you stay in deep sleep, right? That's what helps you stay in deep sleep and get longer deep sleep, which is extremely important for your cognitive health, all right? So knowing what the carbon dioxide level is in your bedroom, and making sure that you have enough oxygen in there is worth doing for your long-term health. Okay, so now we're going to talk about, okay, so these are just some studies that show that indoor air pollution, respiratory health, and all the problems that can happen because of, you know, not good indoor air. So now we're finally got to the plants. It only took me 20 minutes. Okay, <laughs> so here we are on plants now and what they can do to help your indoor environment. Um, basically, here is a list of about nine things that they can do for your indoor environment. And these are all backed by published medical studies. So this is great, but we're going to talk about each one of them in varying degrees. The ones that I like the most is the toxin removal and the volatile organic compound absorption. And then I like the humidity regulation and oxygen production. But honestly, you know, all of it's pretty awesome. Um, you know, you'd have to have a lot of plants for noise reduction because it's the leaf area, surface area, that makes it. Uh, but then I also love this part too because I actually like plants, but that's just a personal thing. There are studies though they've done on that too. So we're going to start with that, the psychological benefits of having plants. And you know, we're, we're, we are fully holistic integrated beings and living in an environment that's pretty I think is important and we don't place enough importance on it. So if you like plants, that, that's a good enough reason to put them in your environment. But there are studies that show, and whole reviews where they take all the published literature and they prove that it, it makes a huge difference. But even the appearance of the indoor plants, which is very on their perception of indoor air quality. Like, oh, just seeing the plants there makes you feel like the air quality is better, even if it's not, which I think is an interesting, an interesting um, thing that I, I looked at. But they did show that Indoor plants actually help your attention, like help you stay, uh, uh, you're paying attention to what you're supposed to. They say it can prevent fatigue uh, during demanding work. Attention restoration does not depend on a defined five minute break. The benefits of plants can occur in offices. And so this was an interesting study and they actually had measurable things. They had people doing proofreading, right? And they measured how many times they looked away and all kinds of stuff. And so it was very interesting. I still feel like a lot of these studies have a subjective aspect to them, but it was still very interesting. Um, it sounds like if you're trying to do a focused activity, if you can have a plant on your desk or in your environment, it will make you happier and able to sit there and pay attention longer. And they've proved it through studies, which is a little bit crazy. Okay, so how do plants clean toxins out of the air? So this is a picture that I took from this book right here, which you can't get on Kindle anymore, or ever. Uh, you can only get a hard copy of it, but it's a really, really fantastic book. So if you, have, if you like anything about this lecture that we're talking about today, this is a great book to order. And, um, and I'll tell you a lot more about it. But this picture is from that book, and they just talk about how you have, plants have transpiration, which means they release humidity into the environment, which, as you know from last lecture, but I'll repeat, it is imperative that you keep your indoor environment between 40 and 60% humidity if you want to reduce transmissibility of infectious pathogens by over 95% in your environment airborne infectious pathogens. So keep your humidity between 40 and 60 percent. Now here in Tennessee, in this area, uh, it's, that almost happens naturally, which is absolutely fantastic. But uh, you know, if it rains, it'll go above 60. Like in the house we measured yesterday when it was raining, 68 percent, which is on the high side. But almost immediately, if you close the door and have the air conditioner on, it goes back down below 60, which is great. <coughs> Because um, you want the ideal sweet spot is 50%, but a little bit on the high side, so between 50 and 60, I'm okay with. I don't want, I would rather you veer on the high side of 50 than on the lower side of 50. And you can watch my indoor air quality presentation where I explain 
how solutes are, are dissolved in the aerosols and how important keeping that humidity in that level is to kill the pathogens in the air and allow the settling time of the aerosol so it'll make them fall to the ground, right? Um, but too much promotes the pathogen's viability. So uh, you, don't want to, you don't want your house regularly over 60% for, for that reason, but also for mold reasons and all of that. But in the winter time is when the problem happens around here. You turn on your heater, we get a cold snap, and you'll find that right away your house will go down to, you know, in the 30s uh, percent humidity. That's when you really want to have plants. You want to have plants and you want to have your little diffusers going. If you have aromatherapy diffusers, you don't have to put the essential oils in if you don't want, but having some moisture put back into the air when your heater is on is very important. Um, but plants, if you have a lot of plants, that'll do it naturally. You just keep make sure they're watered and they're not all cactuses, you know, that they're actually big, big leafy plants. And like this plant's a fantastic plant. It's called the pothos plant. And um, it is a great plant at uh, releasing moisture into the air. But the roots actually con convert the pollutants into uh, usable nutrients, which is interesting. And so this book was written, and it's the book here on the left, Okay, it's that, that book right here. It's written by a guy named Dr. Wollerton, and um, it is all based on a study he did in 1989 for NASA, which we're going to talk about in some depth. And um, basically, Dr. Wollerton, Wolverton in 1989 uh, did a study to see which plants, which normal, typical, common house plants you can buy at Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever, uh, were the best for removing different toxins and for converting carbon dioxide into oxygen and those kinds of things. And he, and he you know, uh, learned a whole lot. And at, as a result of this um, study that he did, which I'm going to go into more depth on, uh, he started designing some of these systems. A lot of these are theoretical, but he did build one called the Biohome. I'm going to show you some pictures of it. But he, he's on the forefront even to this day. He has his own company where they are trying to des design bio scrubbed air for indoor indoor environments and um, it's really pretty fantastic actually it's using plants to scrub our air even in our indoor buildings not just in space right and so even for our home like this one's a home where they take the they use even it for sewage treatment and purification and then it routes the air right back into the house so it's really he's got some great um, uh, stuff going on he's what I would consider on the cutting edge of that kind of uh, ecological home all right but in 1989 they did this NASA bio home and they basically built this thing it's super super tight and it's a complete full and complete ecosystem in here with sewage and water, you know, all being recycled and everything, and air. And they wanted to see, they call it the, uh, an early experiment in closed ecological life support system. It's very tightly sealed, meaning completely, and could it, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. They said, before the plants were introduced, anyone entering this would experience burning eyes and respiratory difficulties, which is exactly the symptoms of sick building syndrome. People complain of itchy eyes and burning eyes. And it's because of all the VOCs coming off of our upholstery and furniture and curtains and, uh, and the glues and the particle boards and those kinds of things. But once the plants were put into this ecosystem, uh, the air quality, the analysis of the air quality indicated that most of the VOCs had been removed and all the symptoms disappeared, which was really fascinating. So here's what it looked like in the bio, in the bio uh, home. Um, this was the, um, the air pur purification and wastewater system. And all these plants right here are mother-in-law's tongue or um, snake plant. And so you're, we're gonna talk about that a bunch. That's one of my favorites. Here's the dining and entertainment area. It's pretty small. Okay, so this is, this is the actual study that was done in 1989. So if you're actually interested in reading the actual study that all of this information from this book came from, th here's the link, you know, have at it. It's a little bit harder to read than the book. The book's easier. And, uh, but some of the interesting conclusions that they've learned from the biohome is that the more air that is allowed to circulate through the roots of the plant, the more effective that the plants are at cleaning the polluted air. So that's interesting, that, and it's uh, really changed my thoughts on how I might pot my plants. <laughs> and then also plants play a psychological role in their welfare that they didn't, they didn't expect and may help them recover from illnesses faster. Uh, so they've actually done studies since then in hospitals, putting plants in some rooms and, um, and then gauging do the people with plants in their room recover in the hospital faster, and it, they do, which is really interesting. Um, 
and it's hard to pinpoint why, you know, because I don't think that the oxygen levels were that different in a well-ventilated hospital room. But anyway, here are some of the uh, their recommendations in this book for how you should water your plants to keep the roots aerated properly without mold growing on the top and other mites and those kinds of things. So. Um, there are planters you can buy that help this water irrigation system and, um, and it'll make your plants even more effective at um, cleaning the air. Although I will be honest, that one right here does not have that system in it, but I might, I might look into it. So there's, right now you can buy these things called air pruning pots, but you can also make your own and drill a whole bunch of holes in it and, uh, and then put the, that aerated pot into another nice pot. Does that make sense? So you can cover up the pot by putting it into another pot, but that will still allow the air circulation that helps the plant be super effective at cleaning the air. Okay, and so this book actually, and this book was written a while ago, um, I've had this for a long time, and they mentioned the Gaylord Opryland Hotel. How many of you have been to the, uh, to, yeah, so have I, recently, I had never heard of it till recently, and um, you know, here's a picture of me there just in November. <laughs> And uh, it's pretty fascinating. If you, if you ever get a chance to go, even if you don't stay there, like you're not staying the night because it's pretty expensive, I highly recommend you go to lunch. Just go to lunch there, right? It's pretty spectacular. And it's the only place in this whole book that they even took, I, they mentioned, I'm like, I've been there, I've been there, right? And they said it's a very impressive um, example of how the plants change the whole feeling of the whole place. And, and I'll be honest with you, it smells like you're in a jungle when you're there. Like it's even the smell and the, the feeling, it really does change the whole feeling of an indoor environment having all of these plants in there. And, um, and it's a pretty neat place to, to, and here I'm eating health food right there. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I was at a conference there. Okay, so I just wanted to mention that because we're in Tennessee, so that was worth mentioning. So if you're ever in Nashville, go to lunch. Go to lunch at the Opry Landfill. All right, so this is another guy who's done, who's based a lot of his work, on, you know, on Dr. Wolverton's stuff. On, and he, he specifically wanted to apply it to buildings, sick building syndrome. And here are the plants, you know, that he talks about in this TED Talk which is an online video that, you know, uh, it's really good. You want to watch it. He's a great speaker. But basically, it's, he's going to be saying the same things I'm saying, which is some plants are better for things than other things. And this one right here, I already mentioned it, is the snake plant. Um, it's or the mother-in-law's tongue. You saw it in the bio home. They were about three feet tall. And they're really, really good for the bedroom. So if you're going to pick a plant for your bedroom, there's two that I recommend. It's mother-in-law's tongue or snake plant. And, um, and Gerber Daisy. Those are the two that are the best for converting carbon dioxide to oxygen at night. And, um, but I'll, I have some other things to say too. It almost doesn't matter, you know, the more research I do into the plants, so, so they, here's a based on assessment of 50 house plants, and they measured them by four criteria, removal of chemical vapors, so VOCs, ease of growth, resistance to insect infestation, and then the transpiration rates, that's how much moisture, and then they, they graded them. And these are the top 10 right here, okay? So areca palm, and I'm gonna go through them in more depth. But you know, the differences, and then even the Lung, uh, in, the lung Health Institute has jumped on board, and they have a whole article you know, on lifestyle, lung disease, and oxygen levels on, you know, the top plants for increasing oxygen. So this is something that's been acknowledged not just by NASA, but even by health institutes, like having plants is helpful. But be that as it may, the, the differences in the oxygen that these plants are able to produce is so small that I'm going to say almost any plant is going to be helpful. Okay, so if you like one better than another one, just as long as you can get it to grow, uh, you know, and be healthy, you're gonna get the benefits. Um, some are a little bit better at removing uh, volatile organic compounds, and so that, in that case, I might recommend different plants. But otherwise, when it comes to auction in the bedroom, just find a plant you like that grows well and easy that you're not gonna kill, and, and that would be great. That's going to give you oxygen in the bedroom. Um, okay, so. 
Let's go into some details. So this is removal of toxic gas formaldehyde. Sorry about the screen being a little off right there, but it says formaldehyde. So this is a list, and they've rated all these plants by which one's the best at removing formaldehyde. Well, who cares about formaldehyde? Well, formaldehyde comes from these sources. So usually you can smell it. If you get branded curtains and they have a flame retardant on them like a lot of new curtains do, you can sort of smell it. And those are the rooms you probably would want to keep uh, these plants in at least until the off-gassing has finished, right? And they will make a huge difference to your health. And um, maybe you don't keep them in there forever, but uh, at least for a year or two after you get new curtains, because the flame retardant the compound is what uh, off-gasses quite a bit. I will tell you an interesting fact. Uh, in medical school, well, I, we, our first year in medical school, we have a cadaver lab, right? It's gross anatomy, where we are investigating some bodies, and the bodies are embalmed with all kinds of embalming fluid, including formaldehyde, and it's very nauseating, the smell inside a cadaver lab. And so our entire room had shelves uh, uh, around the entire room, and all the, every single shelf, I think we had 60, a lot. We had nothing but Boston firms we, we, the, everywhere <laughs> to try to help remove the formaldehyde. I don't know if it did it or not because the smell was so strong, but I did find it interesting that someone knew something because they put Boston firms in our cadaver lab. Okay, so here's another one. Here's removal rates of xylene and tol toluene by house plants. So what, what has those? Well, here's some common sources of them. You know, if you have a a wood stove or a wood fireplace that you're using in the wintertime, these are some plants you might want to have in the room with your fireplace or your wood stove. You know, an areca palm or dwarf date palm. These are some of the, the ones that, these top three for sure would be great ones to have like in the corner of your living room with your wood stove because of the, uh, the off -gas. Or like if you have a room, an office that you have a printer in and you're always printing things, then I would put an areca palm in that office, you know, space. Because um, it works, as you can tell, significantly better than like a piece lily, right? All right, and so then keep going. Here's sources of ammonia. So let's say maybe you in your kitchen or something you have you use ammonia to clean the floor. You know maybe you have one of these plants in that area. So. Um, also, for example, I used to have a cat litter box and, uh, and I put it in the laundry room. That's where I kept the cat litter box and it always had a smell of ammonia. Like that's when I knew I had to change the litter because the urine itself of cats is very high in ammonia. That might be a perfect place wherever you put your cat litter box is to put a lady palm and that's what that looks like. You know, put a couple lady palms near your cat litter box and that will help remove that ammonia from the air. And then lastly, for uh, chemicals, specific chemicals, uh, I'll bring up the peace lily. So peace lilies weren't very good, if you remember, for uh, some things. What was it? Peace lilies were bad for xylene and toluene, but they're great. They're for acetone, right? So if you work in a nail salon or you're, if, if you happen to be, you constantly, you know, there's a place where you always, in your bathroom, that you're always, um, changing your nail polish or something, a piece of lily in and around that area could be very beneficial to remove that from your air. Okay, so this is, uh, you know, for your, uh, for your reference later, I don't know if you can read it, um, but these are the top ones uh, from various lists that I combine, and um, it emits a high oxygen, which is what I really care about, it also purifies the air. So. I picked these a lot because they had a great combination of producing a lot of oxygen and removing a lot of volatile compounds. So it was like a two for one special and they were pretty good. Um, this one they say the best place is the living room and I like the ones that have the big leaves on them because they transpire a lot too. So they will add a lot of humidity to your environment. So that's one that I like. Gerber daisy, I think I already mentioned that. If there's top two ones for your bedroom, it would be the snake plant or the Gerber daisy. Now, I've tried the Gerber Daisy, and I kept it alive for one year before I killed it. So <laughs> um, it's a little bit harder to keep alive, at least from my perspective, but some people have a green thumb. If you can keep it alive, it's fantastic for the bedroom. It creates a lot of oxygen. And it does like, it prefers sunlight. So if you can, you know, put indirect light during the winter and, and keep it watered. It's pretty. I love the color. It has these bright, bright flowers, which is fantastic. Um, but yeah, high levels of oxygen at night, 
while simultaneously removing harmful chem chemicals, which is great. It's beneficial for those suffering from sleep apnea and breathing disorders. Keep one on the nightstand. So I did that for a year. Yep, that's about how long. <laughs> and I found that I can't find them at Home Depot as easily. This is a harder plant these days for me to find to buy. So if you find it, pick it up. You know, I'd say definitely give it a try. And then here's the money plant. Um, it's re renowned for its ability to remove chemicals, so that's great. It's like an toluene. Uh, it's, this one though is toxic to cats, dogs, and small children, so be careful about that one. And, um, but otherwise, it's a great one. It does all, and so here's the money plant, or the mother-in-law's tongue, or the snake plant. Uh, if you can get a bigger one, that's great. That's better for the bedroom. Um, and, you know, I, I uh, plant, I fed mine with some mineral water, because I'm like, great, this is, and I it just about killed it. So it just likes regular water, okay? <laughs> just regular water. Don't put anything extra in it. Uh, it's also a native desert plant. So uh, let it completely dry out. Don't follow this. And dry. It says once a week. Don't do that. It says weekly. Don't do weekly, okay? Uh, it, it needs to be totally dry, like dry as a bone. And then you soak it, okay? Completely soak it. And, um, and then it will thrive, okay? And, uh, and then in the summer, it does love direct sunlight occasionally, like because it's a desert plant, right? So, but if you do that, they say it's indestructible. I thought it was funny. They say it's nearly indestructible. And like, yeah, except if you're me, right? <laughs> <laughs> because I just about destroyed mine. But I'm, my, they're coming back to life because I had to get online and read some, some special details on how to keep it alive. But basically, don't overwater it. That's the big thing. It really needs to be almost like desert rock hard before you soak it. Okay. So, Arika Palm. This one was, I think, I can't remember which poison it was now, but. Well, one of them, we said this was a good one for, and this was definitely comes up on almost every single list. It's for removing formaldehyde, xylene, and toluene. I think this was the one we said it in the room with a wood stove, right? Um, anyway, but it's also uh, really great at converting carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen, so, so really great uh, one to have. And then aloe, I, I put this one in here. It, um, it has a lot of medicinal benefits and it cleans the air. It does release oxygen at night. Not as much as some of the other ones, but surprisingly, a large amount of oxygen is released. So if you can get a triple benefit from this, because you can also use the leaves medicinally, you know, so hey, why not? If you can get three benefits out of one plant, do it. And this one I've managed to not kill. I, I somehow don't kill this one, so I have good luck with my aloe plants. And then spider plants, another great one. To me, these are messy. I, I, they make a mess, in my opinion. But they're, I can't kill it, so that's great for me. And um, it grows quickly. It's easy to propagate, which is absolutely true. It's a great beginner plant, forgiving. It needs well-drained potting mix. And um, I have that one in my bedroom as well. So I have like two, three or four plants in my bedroom. And this is one of the ones I have in my bedroom. And then here's a bamboo plant. They also say it's nearly indestructible, and I think I just about killed that one too. So both of the ones that they say are indestructible, I have killed, right? Or just about. I, I think I've got this one recovering uh, barely, <laughs> but it's pathetic. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think I overwater things is what it amounts to. But um, you know, it says high quality water, avoid direct sunlight. I'm not sure what I did to, to ruin this one, but um, if you can keep that one alive, go for it. It is toxic to animals, so don't bring, get one if it's. Um, this is my favorite because this one is just like crazy easy to grow and it just keeps like a waterfall flowing out. I don't do anything to it and it just goes crazy and, um, and so then I, I cut off the, the pieces and I'll water put them in water they'll grow roots and then um, and then you can have another plant right so they, and you can give them away to friends and they will produce a lot of oxygen and I put this up near on my desk so I can see it when I'm working and uh, it helps my mood I love it so uh, highly recommend the poplos plant and then lastly we're, we're going to be ending a little early which is great so you guys can ask me a lot of questions um, I highly recommend getting a, a carbon dioxide sensor for your room uh, this is the one that's right there and it works great. You can connect it to your phone. I don't bother doing that, but you, you can track trends over time if you want. Um, I don't bother. Uh, this is uh, another picture of it. And then here's another one. This one I found to be more finicky, and I have to calibrate it more. And so I like to compare, but I trust, I trust the results on this one more. Um, it seems to be less um, sensitive. And what's the name of the larger one? That one is... 
I don't know what the name of it is. I would just Google it. All you got to do is get on Amazon and type in carbon dioxide monitor and you'll recognize it okay. by the picture. And you guys will have the PowerPoint. It'll be one of the first ones come up, you know. And, uh, and I like it too because it has the humidity sensor on it too, which is great. So then you know. And so what is the humidity in here? I'm curious. Let's take a look. Okay, so it's a little high because it's been raining. Um, what does this humidity say? So this one says 57, so that's interesting. There's a big tolerance. I have a, a, a sensor that's just for humidity and I trust it more. <laughs> but so it looks like we're somewhere between this high and this low. I don't think it's 68 in here because it's not raining right now. Usually it, when it's raining, it'll be about 68%. Um, I bet you it's somewhere in the 60s in here, which is great. Um, I would rather it be around 60 than, um, than too low, like 40. So. Let's see here. So these are the two that are right there. So that's the other one, the white one I have there. And then you can get small ones too. So if like you use a sauna a lot, let's say you go to the YMCA and, and you use the sauna or you're in your vehicle a lot, I highly recommend you get one that you can take with you just to see what it's what the air is and you know, that you're breathing in your car for an hour in traffic or, or in your sauna. Um, I brought mine in my sauna and I, because it felt stuffy in there, but I'm like, well, maybe it feels stuffy because I'm sweating and it's hot, you know, and uh, no, it was carbon dioxide for me in this tiny enclosed space. So I, now I opened the door and try to get some air in the sauna, you know, occasionally if I'm going to be sitting in there a long time. Um, I like sauna marathons. I stay in there forever. And that's it. So uh, we ended a little bit early, but uh, this is great because now you guys can ask me any questions you want about sleep and deep sleep or anything at all, like if you have uh, questions about, um, go for it.